Uh, my daughter Grace was doing homework and she got this sign. And I had PTSD flashbacks because in primary school, I ne can never figure out the greater than, less than signs, right? You're like one's this way and one's that way and they mean completely opposite things and I didn't know which was which. Until one of my friends, I, I believe it was my friend or a teacher, but let's say it's my friend, uh, introduced me to the idea of Pac-Man. Because if you look at it like Pac-Man, Pac-Man always wants to eat the greater value. And so the greater than sign is like a chomping mouth of Pac-Man. Who knew that if you use video games to explain mathematics to me, that it'll be more helpful for me? Um, greater than, this concept. But that's the idea between the greater than is that one thing is greater than another thing. Uh, but today we're not talking about numbers or integers, but rather we're talking about Jesus. For in this passage, Jesus is compared to Satan, Mary, Solomon, and Jonah. And in all of these cases, Jesus is greater than. If Jesus is greater than, then Jesus is worth following because Jesus is greater. Jesus is worth loving because Jesus is greater. Then Jesus we put our trust because Jesus is greater. A lot of what we do and say flows from a better appreciation and awareness that Jesus is greater than anything else, anyone else, anything we could commit our life to. Jesus is greater than. So that's where we're heading today. Greater than is the name of the sermon. But I do need to note that we have two little um, detours that come up from this passage. One is on Bible translations, one is on Mary. Uh, when detours come up, I think it's useful just to spend a little bit of time unpacking them because uh, often they touch on things that we think about but we don't actually discuss all that often. Uh, and another aspect here is that I actually um, brainstormed this sermon with Nexus Youth Group Bible Study last week. Okay, so they helped me uh, prepare this sermon, hence we have props. Uh, and so uh, thanks to them and, and they're a part of this. Excellent. Okay, so when we look at uh, the uh, passage, what we see is there an action by Jesus and then there are two responses to that action. You get a group of people who are calling Jesus heretic. And, in certain, and by doing so, in themselves, they are heretics. You have another group of people who are not uh, rejecting Jesus outright, but they are skeptics in the sense that they want a sign. Uh, dance for me, dance for me, monkey boy is kind of what they're saying to Jesus, okay? And so you have an act, a group of heretics, and a group of skeptics, with the question being, how do we respond to Jesus? And the overall theme being, Jesus is greater than. All right, uh, so let's start with the act. One verse, verse 14. Uh, Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute. And straight away, we hit our first detour. Um, I, we were looking at this in uh, youth group Bible study, and the kids had their CEV Bibles out, which is what we use for youth group and for kids' church. The CEV version of this uh, translation is, Jesus forced a demon out of a man who could not talk. Now, see the difference there. The NIV says that the demon was mute. But the CEV says, or implies, that the man was mute. It puts the onus on a different thing. And so at Bi a New Spirit Bible study, we're going, well, hang on, which one is right? And this raises the question about Bible translations. See, in Bible translations, there's a whole spectrum, don't go to that one, we'll stay on this, a whole spectrum of different ways, uh, the, different translations of the Bible. And you have ones that are more literal, and you have ones that are more paraphrased, but easier to understand. And so in this situation, I looked up, I did a little bit more research and looked up other versions. And I found that uh, the more paraphrased, more simple Bibles weren't, didn't do justice to this verse as well. For example, the ISB says, Jesus was driving out a demon out of a man who was unable to talk. Again, emphasis on the man. And then the message is slightly more ambiguous, but not all that more helpful. Uh, Jesus delivered a man from a demon that had kept him speechless. I'm not saying that the demon itself was mute. So what, that's one way of looking at it. But if you go to the more literal translations, like the Holman, for example, well, the NIV you have there, but the Holman and the ESV, they both put the, trans the emphasis on the demon, right? So then I went to my Greek interlinear Bible, which is basically, it uh, translates the Greek New Testament from a word from word, okay? 
And in that translation, uh, it says uh, that he was casting out a demon and it was mute. All right. So in this question, the demon was mute. Okay. Well, let's put that aside. And the CV has it is uh, making it losing that nuance by trying to make it simple and understandable. In relation to Bibles, there are many different Bibles that we can read. Okay. Here at the church, we read the NIV. And that's because I find it's very easy to understand, but as well as for the most part, and let's not even talk about male pronouns, uh, for the most part, it is uh, quite accurate in the translation. Okay. But let's say you're, say you're hitting a verse and you're not sure, you don't understand it. You don't understand what it's saying at all. Well, then one idea is to go to an easier to understand Bible translation and see what that says. Or you're struggling with a passage and, you're not, and you don't know it says what it really says. Well, then you go to a more literal translation. Uh, like, uh, so, what is going on? Uh, like the uh, interlinear or the um, ESV or the Holman. Uh, they're kind of my preferences for the more, uh, uh, yes, for the more literal is Holman and ESV. That's my personal preference. Uh, for the more easy to understand, the CV and the message is my preference. I grew up in the Good News Bible. I don't know if you remember that. I was a, as a Baptist, we used to have the Good News Bible, and that's down that way as well. All this is to say is that you, it's helpful to understand where the Bible you are reading comes from and where it stands on the spectrum, so that if you get stuck, you can check out a different Bible on a different side of the spectrum, and that will help it make it a little bit more sense. Uh, so as a church, we decided when I first came that we were going to stick with the NIV 2011. Um, it does have its faults, but it's good for the most part. However, we could have easily gone to ESV. But the ESV is slightly more difficult to understand, and that's why we stuck with NIV. All right, detour over. So, the man, uh, was, the man was afflicted with a demon that was mute. All right? And the de mute demon inflicting the man caused the man to be mute. Well, there's a couple of important applications just for this one verse before we go any further. And to get there, let's look at this photo. Uh, this photo was taken in 2011 uh, during the Vancouver Hockey Riots. Uh, the Vancouver Canucks lost the Stanley Cup to the Boston Bruins and a riot broke out as a result. Uh, one witness said it was complete chaos. Rioters set two cars on fire and I saw looters break the window at a department store. And amidst that chaos, this picture was taken. The world is on fire behind them, a riot police in front of them, and they're supposedly having a little smooch, uh, seemingly unconcerned about the reality that is transpiring around them. Now the truth of the photo is that they were actually pushed over by riot police. Uh, the female was very distressed, and so the man was consoling her uh, to try and calm her down, okay? But you look at that photo, and you think two people are not aware of their reality in the slightest. They're in this middle of a war, and they're like, do 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 they're completely ignorant of it, yeah? Well, that's kind of what we can be as Christians. See, as, especially in the West, we are very uh, ignorant of the spiritual realities that is around us. We read a passage like this and we are reminded that there are demons, that demons can afflict people, and that that can have a physical and emotional and mental response. Demons are active in our world, and we must be aware of this uh, because the Bible says it is true. In the West, we're very materialistic, we like science, we like things that we can see. But as a result, we've often discounted the reality of what the Bible talks about. About a whole world that is real and that it affects us, but we don't give much thought to. So I think the first thing here is we have to be aware that there is a spiritual reality. That demons are real. The supernatural world is existence in the reality that we face. And the next thing we note is that demons can afflict people. Uh, this man had a disability caused by a demon. The demon was mute and it made the man mute. Without the demon, the man was able to speak again. He had a disability because of a demon. Now, this is, I am not saying that all disabilities are <laughs> afflictions by demons. I'm not saying that because it's not true. But this is an example where it has happened. And that's something we've never thought, often don't even think about. Again, this is part of being aware of the spiritual realities around us. 
Now we have to be very careful how we think about this and how we use it. And we don't just generalize it around because it's not the reality. But this is an example of something that can and does happen in our world. The final thing that we need to note is that Jesus is greater than the demons. Jesus rules over the demons. Jesus casts out the demons. And even in Luke 8, when there is a legion of demons, Jesus is still more powerful. Jesus is still able to tell them where to go when they must do it. We take assurance in knowing that our Lord, our Jesus, the one that we serve, the one that we love, the one that we trust in, is greater than, stronger than, more powerful than anything demonic. We take assurance that Jesus is greater than Satan. And as a result, the spiritual world is not something that we need to freak out about because we know that the one on our side is greater than the one that is on theirs. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that we mess with it. Uh, I often talk about the supernatural world with youth group. And the way, best way that I talk about it is that we've got to treat evil spirits and, and uh, the like like dog poo. Uh, we're not scared of dog poo. Uh, when we come across dog poo, we go, ah, dog poo. No, we don't do that. We go, oh, it's dog poo. I'm going to walk around with dog poo. I'm not going to put my hands in the dog poo. I'm not going to play with the dog poo. I'm not going to jump in the dog poo. No, no, no. I know it's there. I'm just not going to have anything to do with it. See, in our horror movies, there are still talks about seances and Ouija boards. And these are things that particularly teenagers are still aware of and still happen to parties. It did for me and it, it does for them. But we don't get involved in those things as Christians because, A, we don't need to. It's not true. It's evil. Why would we want that into our life? But also, we know that God is greater, that Jesus is greater, that Jesus is stronger. Okay. So that's the act, right? Jesus casts out a demon that was mute. The second thing that happens is that Jesus then focuses on the group of people who are claiming that he is a heretic and as a result, showing that they are heretics. We see this in verse 15. But some of them said, by Beelzebub, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. Uh, first thing here was Beelzebub name. Uh, it sounds similar to a word that translates as Lord of the Flies. Uh, but this is not a pass the conk uh, piggy kind of scenario. Um, rather, it is more likely to have roots to Baal worship. Uh, but the simple way of looking at it is that the Lord of the Flies, Beelzebub, is a reference to Satan. Okay? So these guys are saying that the way Jesus casts out a mute demon is through the power of Satan. And it's interesting. They're not arguing that the miracle was fake. They're not saying uh, that it was an illusion or a trick. They can't deny that something actually happened here. The dude went from mute to being able to speak. But they question how he did it. Because uh, really, he either did it through the power of God or the power of Satan. Uh, if he did it through the power of God, then that means they are wrong in persecuting him. They are wrong in denying and rejecting him. And they have built their whole life on a wrong set of priorities and values, and they have a lot of life decisions to make. They don't want to admit that. They don't want to change their life. They don't want to make those life decisions. And so instead, they go for the other option, and they claim Jesus is doing it through the power of Satan. But then Jesus gives uh, two very clear reasons of why that is not the case. The first is found in verse 17b. Any kingdom divided against itself will be ruined. And a house divided against itself will fall. If Satan is divided against himself, how can his kingdom stand? No group will last long if it is fighting amongst itself. Civil war destroys countries. It does not build it up. Dissension in any group often leads to their minimization, to their defeat. And we see this in political parties. As soon as it becomes a political party it all becomes about faction and infighting, it often leads to their defeat. When there is one fighting against the other inside, it is never good for, for that organization, for that group. And so it is in the spiritual world. If Satan is working against Satan, then that is not going to work well for Satan. And Satan is evil and does not think rightly about truth and reality, but he is committed to one thing, and that is gaining more power. He's not about to do something that takes away from that goal, as is being suggested here. Uh, it's not something he would do. 
So as a result, there's no grounds to say that Jesus is doing something against Satan by the power of Satan. Uh, second reason that Jesus then gives is found in verse 19. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your followers drive them out? Now, Jesus here is referring to Jews who were casting out demons. We saw an example of this a couple of weeks ago in chapter 9, where someone else other than the disciples was casting out demons. And so Jesus is kind of going, well, if you think I do it by demons, then who do they do it by? And he's kind of saying, well, if, you're, if you think they're doing it by the power of God, then why do you think I'm doing anything differently? He's kind of highlighting that they're being Jesus-ists, like discriminatory against Jesus. It's like, oh, it's okay for our guys, but it's not okay for you. Well, no, hang on. Chances are, we're both doing it by the power of God. Um, you're, being, uh, you're just using this as an argument against me. And then Jesus goes on and gives an alternative answer of how he did what he does. And it's the finger of God in verse 20. But if I drive out demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. I love this image, the finger of God. It's such a powerful image. But to truly understand it, we need to go back to the Old Testament, right? Because the Old Testament is where we see this image first. It comes up in Exodus 8, 19, uh, where the plagues are happening. Uh, there are gnats on the land of Egypt. Uh, God is in the process of taking the Israelites out of Egypt and delivering them to the promised land. But you've got the plagues. And Pharaoh's got all these gnats everywhere. And Pharaoh goes to his magicians, hey guys, you replicate this as well to like show shame Moses and to show that he doesn't have all the power. And the magicians are like, we can't do that. We could do it with the staff and the snake, but that's just an illusion. We can't do this act because it is done by the finger of God. And so this idea of the finger of God is that it's a clear, powerful act showing who is boss, showing that God is God. And so then when Jesus casts out demons, he is, it is a clear act that he is using the power of God, that he is who he says he is. But there's another point to it as well, because the finger of God also comes up in the Ten Commandments in Exodus 31, 18, where the commandments on a tablets of stone are inscribed by the finger of God. And so the finger of God is also related to when God is doing something big in terms of his redemption plan for his people. Because that's the law was a big part of getting God's people to heaven, you know? Um, there were many different parts, but the law was a key part. And so the finger of God is used. Well, Jesus uses the finger of God. Why? Because he is another huge part in the redemption of his people. It's part of the plan, part of the steps of getting us reunited with him for those who believe. So the finger of God is a clear, defined act that is the power of God, but the finger of God also shows that he's doing something in the redemption plan for his people. Excellent. And I also love, like, it's the finger of God. You know, it's not like the bicep of God. It's not the pictorial muscle of God. It's not the calves of God. It's like his pinky. And he can do all this just by his pinky. And again, it's highlighting the powerful nature of our God, that Jesus is greater than uh, then Jesus gives us, two, continuing with this supernatural theme, as well as the greater than theme, and Jesus gives us two tricky images that are hard to work out. The first is found in verse 21 to 22. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own house, his possessions are safe. But when someone stronger attacks and overpowers him, he takes away the armor in which the man trusted and divides up the spoil. A uh, quick side note, uh, I was looking at this verse and a lot of uh, <coughs> Americans use this verse to endorse gun ownership. Um, there's actually a gun shop called Luke 11, 14, okay? That is not what this is talking about. It's not talking about the physical protection of God, uh, of homes, because this is talking about the spiritual realm. Um, and the first strong man is not uh, someone, it's not myself, the strong man is actually a reference to Satan. Satan, who has a house, and he is comfortable in it, and he is reigning, and he is not attacked, and he is strong. But then a stronger man comes, and overpowers the strong man, kicks him out of the house, and then takes residence. Jesus is saying, Satan is the strong man, Jesus is the stronger man. Again, goes with the theme. Jesus is greater than Satan. Well, another way of thinking about this is, let's say you're in the gym, and you see this bloke. 
and he's fit, right? Like he's been working out and he has a plan and he doesn't skip leg day. Like he goes to the gym and he does well and, he, and he's looking all right. But then you compare him to like Matt Fraser doing CrossFit or the strongest man in the world, which this guy is. Apparently, someone bench pressed 400 kilograms. I'm not sure I could bench press four. Like, it's crazy how strong some people are. But you get those guys and you compare them to the fit guy at your gym, and the fit guy at your gym has no comparison. It doesn't even hold a bar to the guys in the strongest man in the world competition or the CrossFit competitions. And that's kind of the comparison here. But while Satan is strong, Jesus is stronger than Jesus is greater than. Jesus is more powerful. And in comparison, Satan doesn't hold a plane to the strength of Jesus. All right, and then another tricky image comes. In verse 24 to 26. When an evil spirit comes out of a man, it goes through arid places seeking rest and does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. When it arrives, it finds the house swept clean and put in order. Then it goes and takes seven other spirits more wicked than itself and they go in and live there and the final condition of that man is worse than the first. The concept here is when a man, uh, a demon has been cast out of a man, okay? But if nothing else fills the man, if the demon comes out, then the man is like an empty house. Now, ideally, what will happen is that the man will then be filled by the Holy Spirit, right? And so when the demon comes back, he can't enter the house because the house has a tenant. Uh, But what Jesus is saying is in times where it is not, the man is not filled by the Holy Spirit. So the demon comes out, wanders around the arid places, which makes sense because remember, demons uh, like to rest in something. Uh, We saw that again, Luke chapter 8, the legion of demons wanted to be put into the pigs. And so again, that clarifies that, though of course the pigs jumped off a cliff, but that's another thing. Uh, all that to say is, the demons like to have a home, right? And so the man did out, get so many of his friends, come back into the house, and the man is in a worse position than he was before. Jesus is kind of saying, someone else has to be in the, the man. So let's, let's put it like this. Visually, right? Uh, the, the jar is the person. The evil spirit is cast out. But unless something fills it, the demon will come back. Now, ideally, what will happen is the Holy Spirit, I know it's got shades of blue, but let's pretend it's all white. The Holy Spirit comes and instead fills the man so that when the demon comes, he can't go in because he's already here filled by the Holy Spirit. And what's more, the demon can't overpower the Holy, the, the Holy Spirit because they will, as we just saw in the previous image, the Holy Spirit is greater than. God is greater than. Right? So the idea... What has happened is this passage has led some people to freak out about being possessed, particularly Christians. Michael, if this is true and demons can possess a person, am I possessed? Well, if you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And so you don't have to worry about an evil spirit coming because you have a tenant in your house. Your cup is already full. You have the Holy Spirit, nothing can beat that. Yeah? So we don't have to worry as Christians about our possession. Because we already are possessed by God, by the Holy Spirit. All right, so that's the tricky analogy too. So then the application of this becomes very similar to the first. The spiritual reality of our world. There are angels and demons, but it's not something we have to worry about because Jesus is greater than. He's able to cast out demons, any number of demons, because Jesus is greater than. Not superior, not inferior, not even equal. Jesus is greater than. The religious leaders thought that he wasn't, and they were wrong. And then the next idea links to the finger of God. Uh, that Jesus is doing what he can do, showing that he is God, showing that he's doing something big in the redemption plan of his people. Uh, so that's very much what's going on here with the heretics. Okay? Then we move to the skeptics. The final group of people who respond uh, to Jesus. But we, before we get there, we get our second detour. And it's found in verse 27 to 28. As Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Uh, there is this trend 
on uh, Instagram at the moment to do some kind of challenge, right? And uh, the one I saw involved ping pong balls rolling down a table. And the idea is that the ping pong ball went in one of these uh, cups, then you would get the prize on that cup, okay? Now, uh, 10 cents, uh, $50, $1. Now let's say I had these out all in front of you and you didn't have to do a challenge. You had a ping pong ball, you could just put it in one of the cups. Which cup would you put it in? Sam, can you tell me which cup you would put in a ping pong ball? Yeah, yes you would. Another switch game coming your way. That's what you would do and that's why we are actually acting this out because I can't afford to give you another switch game. Um, all this is to say is, yes, of course, we have the, the choice. We're going to choose the greater than. Well, here, the woman is going, Mary is blessed. And Jesus is going, yeah, she's blessed. But obeying the word of God is greater than. See, there are denominations of Christianity which have taken Mary and put her on a pedestal. And they have venerated her and elevated her. And some have elevated her to a godlike status, to the point where that is the one that we pray to, and that is the one that we worship to, and that is the one we idolize. But Jesus is kind of saying, yes, she's good. Mary is good. Mary is blessed. But he does so by putting her in a regulated hierarchy. She's not greater than. She's not greater than Jesus. She is not the one that we are to be praying to. She is not the one that we are to be worshipping. What is more important is obeying the word of God. What is more important is Christ. And so we need to be careful that we don't elevate Mary to a position that she does not attain. All right, so going back to the skeptics. Uh, this is a group of people who wanted to see more. Verse 29, as the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. Just love that, right? The crowds increase, and like church people, again, this is very similar to Luke chapter 9, where three people wanted to come to Jesus, and Jesus goes, you're not going to come because the cost is too great, and implies that he's right. Um, he doesn't make it easier for them as the crowds increase. He actually makes it harder. The crowds increase, and instead, Jesus goes, this is a wicked generation. The reason for this is the reason the crowds are increasing because they wanted to see the signs. Dance for me, dancey for me, monkey boy. That's what they wanted. Do some cool tricks. Uh, we were at Dreamworld, we saw a magician. Uh, the place was absolutely packed because we all wanted to be entertained by a magician who can do cool tricks. And that's kind of the idea which was happening with Jesus. But Jesus wasn't doing tricks, he was doing miracles. He was doing healings. He was doing signs showing that he was the son of God, showing that he was the Messiah. But they didn't want to accept that bit. They just wanted to see the cool tricks. It's kind of like they were asking for a sign. Uh, there's a, a clip, a scene in Bruce Almighty, where he's in his car and he's praying. He's saying, dear God, show me a sign. And there's a sign that he drives past saying, caution ahead. But he doesn't pay attention to that. Uh, then there's another one, uh, and he's going, Lord, I need a sign. And so a, a truck comes in with all warning signs on the back of it. Stop, a danger ahead, caution, caution. But he doesn't need to see any of that. He overtakes the truck and rides into a ditch. He had signs, he wasn't accepting them. And remember, the crowds had just seen that Jesus had healed a man. He'd cast out a demon. A man went from mute to being able to speak. He had been doing signs. But that wasn't enough for them. There is, uh, that is an issue for people today. Often people say, give me unrefutable sign. Give me absolute proof that there is a God and then I will believe. Well, A, he already has. God has given you all that you need to believe. Whether it's common grace in Romans 1 or whether it's the Bible, historically proven, um, whatever it is, it, God has already shown you. God has given you all the evidence you need. The second thing is it is through faith that we believe. There is a jump required, and that's what it means to be a Christian. And then finally, even if he did it in the way that we wanted, we would find another excuse to not really believe, because the cost would be too great for us. The idea of asking for a sign is asking the wrong question, and it never leads to a deeper relationship or a deeper knowledge of God. All right, so Jesus instead says, I'm excited, I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah. Uh, Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days. And that's kind of what Jesus is pointing to. 
Uh, he's using Jonah, saying, I am like Jonah because I'm going to be in the belly of the fish for three days in relation to his death and resurrection. For he was died on the Friday, on the third day he rose again. And that's what he's using this reference for. Uh, and then uh, remember that um, this section is all about Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. So it's all about his journey to the cross. And this is another example of it. Because he uses Jonah to say, point to what's going to happen in Jerusalem on the cross. And then verse 32, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. But they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now one greater than Jonah is here. Jonah went to Nineveh. He preached and people repented. One who is greater than Jonah is preaching, but the people are not repenting. And he uses this again in relation to the Queen of the South. Verse 31. The Queen of the South will rise at the judgment with the men of this generation and condemn them. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now one greater than Solomon is here. Uh, the Queen of the South, I always thought was Dolly Parton, but that's not who it's referring to. Uh, this Queen is most likely the Queen of Ethiopia or Egypt. Uh, who travelled a very long way uh, to King Solomon to sit under his wisdom, uh, to be taught by him, to listen to him. And again, Jesus is comparing this to himself. This queen travelled from the ends of the earth to hear this wisdom, to sit under this teaching. Well, now you have someone greater than Solomon and you're refusing to listen. You just want me to dance. You don't actually want to repent you don't want to actually be taught by me. Often we value something more far away rather than the thing that is right in front of us. I'll give you an example. Um, my favourite uh, burgers in Sydney, what I believe is the best burger in Sydney, is Mr G's. Uh, it's in North Strathfield. And I've had a number of times I've travelled up there to uh, procure its delicious wares. However, to go, it's about 25, half an hour, and this parking's a bit tricky. So at least half an hour to get there, half an hour back, that's a little bit far to get a burger, right? So I don't go that often, but that's my favourite. That's by far the best burger in Sydney. Until the youth group guys keep talking to me about Chevos. Uh, Chevos is uh, a, a food stop. It's only open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights, and it's in Roselands. It's really close to me. Like, I can literally walk there. And I'm not talking Roselands, Roselands. It's on this side of the Roselands Shopping Centre, Roselands. It's near Tapacho, near Duo Duo. It's really close. And you head towards Lakemba Maccas and you'll get there. Uh, and they keep saying that this is the greatest burger they've ever tried, that Chevo's has the best burgers in Sydney. But I still say it's Mr. G's because I haven't embraced that which is right in front of me. I need to go to Chevo's to, to probably be corrected and understand what they're talking about. But there's an hour queue every night, so I don't know. I will do it, I will do it, but that's the idea, yeah? We, we value higher something that is far away than that which is right in front of us. And that's what the Jews were doing. They were waiting for a Messiah that would never come because the Messiah was right there in front of them. Jesus was greater there. Jesus was right there in front of them, and yet they would not respect him, they would not listen to him, they would not be taught by him, they would not repent to him. They kept looking for other options instead. Throughout this whole section, Jesus is time and time again saying, I am greater than. But it all raises the question then, that if he is, how are we responding to him? There are people in our world who will reject him completely. You are not who you say you are, which is what the people in our world most often say. There are others who are not sure, they're entertained by the possibility of Jesus, but they want more. Show me a sign, show me a sign, but no sign will be great enough and they will never come in. As us as Christians, we acknowledge that Jesus is greater than. But then if we truly had a good understanding and awareness of that, are we living that out? Because often in our life choices, we are choosing something other than Jesus. Often when we refuse to read the Bible for the entire week and lay it on our bookshelf collecting dust, in our actions we are saying that the TV is greater than, that, um, that my friend's advice for my life, who isn't a Christian, they are greater than, that the self-help book is greater than, that the worldly messages are greater than. Jesus is greater than, but then is that reflected in our life? Let's pray. Dear Lord, we praise you that you are greater than. 
We praise you, Lord, that you have power over the spiritual realm. That not, you cannot be beaten. That you are absolute in your victory over Satan. He can't hold a flame to you and we praise you for that. Uh, we pray, Lord, that that, would, uh, that assurance and awareness would help us operate as a Christian in our lives. We also praise you, Lord, that you are greater than That you are greater than Satan. That you are greater than Mary. That you are greater than Jonah. That you are greater than Solomon. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone listening to this message that has not received you, that they will. That they will re stop rejecting you outright, refusing to listen, not believing that you are who you say you are. I pray, Lord, for those who are uh, questioning, um, but they're still wanting more. I pray, Lord, that I pray, Lord, that they would make a jump. I would pray, Lord, that they would get the answers that they need to answer in order to commit and not hold face palm you any longer. And Lord, for us as Christians. Help our lives be lived in a response that you are greater than as we live in the shadow of the cross. In your name.